<laughs> well, we've got an active tropical situation. If you've been following it throughout the weekend, I want to give you some parameters on what's going on with Idalia. The Idalia, the storm that is currently located in the Northwest Caribbean Sea and headed for the Gulf of Mexico. And it looks like we're going to dodge the bullet on this one. Although we could see some local impacts with rip currents. Yes. Yeah, so in the Fox 10 viewing area, the main concern is rip currents. So Mobile, Pensacola beaches, that's your Bowen County beaches, all your kind of Western Florida panhandle beaches. The main concern for us is dangerous rip currents. Um, rip current risk is going to be high in the next couple of days or within the next couple of days and all through midweek. It's going to be not the time to be down at the beaches, even though for us, temperatures are changing. Our temperatures are a little bit cooler. So, And we're definitely going to touch in on that as well. So we're going to break down Idalia, then we're going to look at Franklin, and then we're also going to talk about the temperatures because this weekend we set that all-time record high at 106, highest temperature ever recorded in Mobile weather history. Yeah, so very hot weekend for us, and then 105 something the next day. So right. This is going to be a welcome change, but we also have to deal with Idalia. All right, well, let's take a look at it right now. Most of the convection is on the southern flank of this system. A little less going on on the northern flank. There's some shear coming out of the north right now. The system is beginning its northward motion. You know, yesterday when you were watching it as one of the in that formation stage, it's kind of looping around there mm -hmm. in the northwest Caribbean Sea. Now it's getting real close to the western tip of Cuba, and we expect it by this evening to start entering into the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, as you mentioned, it kind of did a perfect little U-turn here, and now it is starting to slowly begin its track north, and as it enters the Gulf of Mexico, that, one, that is when we're expecting the strengthening stage of the storm. And the water temperatures are going to get progressively higher as it goes along towards the northern Gulf. Let's take a look at the wind field here. And uh, as far as what's going on with that, I, I'm the one that, that did that little live <laughs> thing there, just to remind you we are live. All right, there is the wind field here, and you can see how we're getting very close to having the center of the system near the exact western tip of Cuba. So if you had to put it on the map geographically, I would say it's in the Yucatan Channel, which is the body of water between the Yucatan and the western tip of Cuba. This is the Northwest Caribbean Sea, and then up here we have the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, and as it tracks in the Gulf of Mexico, it is going to continue to strengthen, as Jason mentioned, warmer water temperatures as it gets into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's going to open the door for some more significant strengthening, more than it already has. Over the last few hours, it's been pretty much at a steady state. We have now, as of the last update, have winds up a little bit at 70 miles per hour. It's taken a minute for these winds to go up. It went to about 60 miles per hour, then stayed there for the past few hours. But one thing that has been extremely consistent, the pressure has been dropping out of, after every recon pass, after buoy observations, we can tell clearly that the pressure is dropping. That, of course, meaning a strengthening storm. At 987 millibars, if you're just looking at pressure, you'd say, hey, we had a hurricane here and uh, 70 mile per hour sustained winds. This is the one o'clock advisory, so this is some new information that's coming in. And you can see it's located just south, southwest of the western tip of Cuba, but it's moving north at eight, so it won't be long, and the center will be coming through the Yucatan Channel and into the Gulf of Mexico. And as it goes further north, the wind shear is going to go from a moderate clip to a lighter clip, which will allow this thing potentially to rapidly intensify. Yes, and as it begins to track kind of deeper into the Gulf of Mexico, the upper level pattern really does change, and that's something that we have observed and that we've that we know is going to happen based on the models. So here's the track. And notice the, in fact, in the past advisory, there's been a change in forward speed. We've seen that creep up a little bit, a few miles per hour now moving north. And you can see in the track history here that finally we have some kind of northern motion. So time is beginning to run out once we get towards the Florida Big Bend area and the Florida coast for preparations. So breaking down the timing, 8 p.m. Monday, so this evening, we're dealing with a Category 1 hurricane. This thing is on the cusp of becoming a hurricane right here in the Yucatan Channel, about to enter the Gulf of Mexico. Then Tuesday morning, Category 1 still, according to the National Hurricane Center forecast, inching closer to the Florida coast. And look, 
at the strengthening trend. In fact, once it gets to about Tuesday evening and it is kind of off the coast, well off the coast of Fort Myers, that is when the upper level pattern really starts to shift. That's something that we've observed in forecast models. It almost looks like thanks to a trough that is over Louisiana, and this is kind of getting into the meteorology of it, so bear with me. There's a trough that's going to be kind of in the central Gulf of Mexico that is going to act as an exhaust system for this storm. So instead of giving it really wind shear, even though there will still be a very small amount of wind shear, that is going to allow for the thunderstorms to ventilate. And, uh, of course, your hurricanes need kind of an exhaust system. You might notice every single time a hurricane comes, you see high cirrus clouds before the storm approaches. That's the exhaust mechanism of the hurricane. So as the hurricane approaches, we should see a little bit more outflow, especially on the northern side of the storm. We're going to be watching to see how far the northern impact spread once this thing reaches Tuesday 8 p.m. just off the coast of Fort Myers there, well off the coast of Fort Myers. But that's the kind of meteorological story, so some of the science behind it. We are expecting an environment that will allow for a significantly strengthening storm. It's what we call a baroclinic boost, and mm -hmm. these forecast intensities, forecast intensity is probably one of the most unreliable things we have in the forecast suite here. We do have a really certain track. It looks like it's an issue for Florida's Big Bend, but the intensity you know, could really be much stronger or slightly weaker than what's being advertised. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see this as a stronger Category 3, considering how warm the waters are in the Gulf, but a lot of that's going to be based on the mechanics of the system. How quickly does it develop that strong inner core? Mm -hmm. And we'll just watch it as it comes across the eastern Gulf, but, but these numbers are just a guide here as to what could occur, but of course it could be stronger, could be a little bit weaker here. And I want to show you some computer models here. And this is really why we feel strongly about the forecast. If you were watching Nicholas this weekend, the, the models were spread out more and now they're very tight. Yes, and this has been a great thing. And now we can see, if you remember watching this weekend, we had a bit of a spread when the storm was in the Yucatan Channel. This area, the models were spread out. But now that we have a more defined northward motion, that eight mile per hour moving north, now the models can latch onto that a little bit better. Also, we have a very solid center of circulation now embedded under thunderstorms. So that makes the job for the models a lot easier. It can just drag the motion however it sees based on steering currents. Yeah, we're not guessing where the storm may begin. We know exactly mm -hmm. where it is and we know where it's going. And so the, the scenarios here, basically stretch from Apalachicola to Tampa. And this area of Florida's coast called the Big Bend is especially vulnerable to storm surge because of the bowl-like nature, just the shape of the coastline. Shape of the coastline, shallow, generally shallow waters as well. It's gonna allow for all the water. Think about this, you have counterclockwise flow around the hurricane. Anybody on Florida's west, west coast is dealing with onshore flow all the water being pushed on shore. Therefore, surge is a significant issue, and that's why we have a whole bunch of surge alerts out there right now. And of course, that's gonna be one of the main concerns for Florida's West Coast and into the Big Bend, where it is the most vulnerable to storm surge. And if there's a silver lining here, you know, you have a lot of development along the Western Florida Panhandle, but once you get past Apalachicola, it becomes what is referred to as the Forgotten Coast. There's not a lot of beach here. So St. Mark's, Cedar Key, Steinhatchee, Homosassa Springs, these areas, there's some fishing communities here, some small towns, but there's not that large scale development mm -hmm. just because, you know, it's not a great place for development. It's very vulnerable yeah. to storm surge and hurricanes. It's a large stretch of very marshy land, really. There's a lot of forests. You have a lot of forests in the Big Bend region and the Forgotten mm -hmm. Coast. So there is a good bit of buffer, but in storm surge, and we've been looking at the storm surge forecasts, that kind of all gets inundated. Uh, thankfully, though, it is not populated, not as populated. All right, let's take a look at what's going on with these models. We've added in the spaghetti plots, and you can see there's not really any scenarios 
that show it getting into our area. We've got east of Walton County, even with the most westernmost models. This is the GFS model, and it's going to show us what's going to happen with this. I'll bring it up full so you can see it. Uh, of course, you got Franklin pulling away, and then right there you can see the system by Wednesday ashore and up into southern Georgia. So will we get any rain out of this? Well, sort of. So we've got a trough right across our area, that upper trough, which is one of the steering mechanisms for this system and we've got a surface front and we've got a lot of moisture so we may see some showers on some thunderstorms on the northern flank both today and Tuesday but Wednesday our rain chances may actually be lower. Yes and all that thanks to being on the drier side of the system. So as the system, this is the European forecast model now, tracks our way. You may see these showers and I'm talking about this mobile area. You say see these showers right here this kind of oriented, that is where our frontal boundary is oriented. And that's kind of one of the factors of the steering flow. We talked about an upper level trough. Associated with the upper level trough, we have a surface level boundary. So you can see, especially this is 4 p.m. Tuesday in the afternoon, the front serving as a mechanism for us to get more showers and thunderstorms. So there that is, you see that being reflected in the model. And then the steering currents taking a dahlia north and east. However, once it gets closer to our area, notice a drier slot here next to the storm. Typically, and we've seen this in past hurricanes, the western side of the storm is drier. They call the east, of course, the dirty side of it. So when we're on the western side, places in the far western, and, and really in the western Florida panhandle, and then the Alabama coast, the Mississippi coast, dealing with drier conditions instead of more. Those of us, those of y'all on the eastern side, of course, the dirty side, that's where we talked about earlier, dealing with onshore flow. You're dealing with a big fetch of rain. We see, and even on the current satellite picture, there's such a large area of moisture. And uh, with that large area of moisture, that's a lot of rain coming in. In fact, you can see this reflected in the European. Look how much rain on the eastern side, while the western side, dry. We're dealing with a northerly wind on Wednesday and dry conditions. Yeah, so as long as we're on the northern flank, and then of course I stopped it intentionally at that three, four o'clock time frame for today and for Tuesday, we're going to have some daytime heating mixed in too. So we, loosely related to Idalia, we are looking at some rain, but then as it moves to the north and to the northeast towards Florida's Big Bend, and on Wednesday we get over on the drier western side, may actually see lower rain. Uh, chances and you can see the European model it's been very consistent with this all along in fact it was the first model to really jump on the actual prediction of a storm to begin with has it going in somewhere very close to Cedar Key Florida yeah so and you can see and this is interesting to look at look at how dry the western side is um, and there was some talk of some dry air in the Gulf of Mexico as the storm moves uh, through the Gulf of Mexico. So that we'll be watching that very closely. Now, what about towards the end of the week? People on the coastal areas of Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, your Charleston, your Savannah, your Jacksonville, um, all the way up, impacts there as well. Definitely, and then it zips out into the mm -hmm. Atlantic and we can start focusing on the next threat. I do think we're going to have a lot of problems with initially storm surge and wind damage mm -hmm. in Florida's Big Bend, but also Jacksonville and Lake City, some of those areas in the interior, and depending on the track, perhaps Tallahassee uh, could have a lot of problems there. What about our local impacts here? And you can see the increasing rip current risk. Water temperature 88 degrees. Now, we're wow. not in our peak beach season. A lot mm. of folks have left, but we are getting closer to the Labor Day weekend, so we may see an uptick of people coming into town early. And on Thursday, the Thursday before Labor Day weekend, we've got a high risk of rip currents. Yeah, I mean, beach plans along the Gulf Coast Wednesday and Thursday are pretty much, water plans are not possible, I don't think. Um, and we know, we know what it's like based on the past ones that we've seen last week. Or was that, what was that last week? I can't even remember. The last disturbance that we had that became right. Harold. That caused a lot of rip currents in our area. Then the same thing. Every single time there's a system in the Gulf, of course, we deal with the rip currents. All right, let's switch gears here and talk about water temperatures. Just how, you know, volatile is the environment that this is in. Right now, water temperature is about 84 or 85 degrees where the storm currently is. 
but as we go to the north along that forecast track, you can see the water temperatures increasing into the upper 80s. And that is a real concern because when you start talking about upper 80s water temperature with a high oceanic heat content too, I mean, the water temperatures are at their peak, not just at the surface, but even below, yeah. there's a lot of fuel for this thing to get stronger. Yes, and it's in the right environment. And we've been kind of watching the possibility for the, del the chances of rapid intensification at first, it was just something that was being mentioned. We knew it in the back of our heads that it's something possible. And now it looks like rapid intensification, a rapid ramp up to possibly major hurricane strength is very much in the question now. And that's why now in the forecast track, we do have a major hurricane on the National Hurricane Center forecast track making landfall in the Big Bend. All right, so let's talk about Franklin a little bit because I know anytime we have a system that is bearing down on the Gulf Coast or people are always wondering, okay, well, what about anything else out there? Is there anything else out there to worry about? In the case of Franklin, nothing to worry about, but this is a monster. This is an incredibly, this has been an incredible evolution of this storm from being disorganized when it was just the east of the Bahamas here, fighting wind shear, fighting dry air. It developed an inner core and it took off. And now it's taking advantage of its environment, a very impressive looking storm. However, the forecast has been interesting and we've been monitoring kind of the environment around it. Take a look at this, 145 mile per hour right now for Hurricane Franklin, a category four major hurricane. Remember major hurricane starts at category three. So a category four, very well defined, well, a very well compact storm. But in the forecast, we've been watching the steering currents. We have a trough to its north. So one of the questions was, does it really hook all the way towards Bermuda or does it hook just towards the north of Bermuda? And based on the forecast track right now, Bermuda is still sitting pretty much right under this icon here in the eastern side of the track. Thankfully, this is a compact storm. But if this were to take the southern part of that track, we would be seeing some kind of impacts either, either way intense wave action probably now for Bermuda. Also wave action along the eastern coast as well. But you can see the United States and of course our area not included in the track for this one. We have a new wave that is coming up off of Africa and that's going to be a common thing for the next really the next month or so. Uh, we're in that Cape Verde season and odds of development here about 50% as this wave just about to emerge out here to the east of the Cabo Verde Islands is going to have a chance of developing. So Idalia, Franklin, and then a new wave, but right now the only thing that's gonna have any impact on us will be the outskirts of Idalia and the potential for some storm surge here. Now, could Idalia actually help our weather and you know we're not wishing a major hurricane on our neighbors to the east but we've got a heat wave problem I mean that's an understatement <laughs> right yeah. so will we start to see some improvements and I kind of want to break that down here if we get a new system that develops the next one would be Jose by the way the one that's out there in the Atlantic so let's talk about August and this historic heat 11 records on the board here Nicholas uh, this is off the charts. I mean, one of them's an all-time record high, and a lot of people get confused by that because I, I remember telling a couple of people, oh yeah, we have an all-time record high, and they're like, whoop-dee-doo. I mean, what's, what's another record high? But what's the difference between a record high and an all-time record high? Yeah, I mean, we keep these daily records. We know what every single day, so the 22nd, the 23rd, we know what the record was for that day, that daytime high. However, Looking at the entire calendar in history, the maximum temperature at Mobile Regional Airport observed was 105, and yep. we hit 106. New yeah. all-time high, hottest it's ever been ever since, of course, in recorded weather recorded history. history. My kids are like, how do they know what it was like when the dinosaurs <laughs> were here? I said, probably a little hotter <laughs> then, but... In recorded weather history, 150 or so years, Yes, 106 degrees, and now the 11th record, and so many days above 100 degrees. This has just been a crushing month. We're about to get some heat relief. 
I uh, want to talk about yesterday's record first. Uh, we don't have a record for today, but if we, we actually may have tied this 97 mm -hmm. already because I saw that in the observations. Okay. 97, the record for Pensacola. So we may get our 12th record, but I doubt we make it to 100 today. There is a heat advisory in effect for our area uh, for today. And the heat index so far has been a little bit uncomfortable outside. Yeah, it's a little bit humid it's a little sticky we have that frontal boundary in our area so it's uh feeling much more humid outside there's and, your record oh, wow we're at 99 we might hit 100. uh the thunderstorms hadn't fired yet they're supposed to pop up within the next couple of hours but 99 crushing the old record of 97 and this is unofficial we may go higher so another record this is incredible i you know in in our forecasting of this we had hope that today would be a little bit better. There's your heat index at 105. Yeah, it is not the greatest right now. And you see 107, Loosedale at 110 for heat index, according to that center. sensor. Gulf Shores at 110 as well. We are still dealing with heat. All of us want rain. Um, we've seen the comments. We've seen what everybody's saying. We all want rain. And it looks like we do get it Monday, uh, today and tomorrow, but waiting for it now. You know, and the eastern shore got some pretty good rain last yes. night, around 3 or 4 in the morning. It was a very it? impressive storm. I didn't sleep, and I decided to go and look at the storm. But it was a really <laughs> impressive storm. Uh, a lot of lightning. I got a lot of pictures sent just because, like, there was so much lightning. And that's uh, just that the storm. beginning. We may see more today. Mm -hmm. Right now, so far, not a whole lot popping up. Uh, there they are. I say that. Uh, <laughs> right there, Sims and Wilmer. And another one just north of Spanish Fort, kind of just off to the west of Bromley there. Mm -hmm. Pop-up thunderstorm. So this is the beginning of the atmosphere. It's conditionally unstable, and we most likely reach our convective temperature at 99 degrees. Yes, and it took 99 degrees, which is great. <laughs> but yeah, Big Creek Lake, it looks like just north of that, there's a little bit of a storm there. Yeah, also, George County yeah, starting George. to see some activity. And uh, let's see if what the future cast does with this. This is a good initialization. Yeah, uh, it's when so we say, well. And we, we've been talking about this in the tropical stuff. We've been talking about this just in daily forecasting. Uh, initialization, model initialization. The model has to get a good reading mm -hmm. of what's happening right now. And, yeah, and this short-term model is showing right about 3 o'clock it was going to go pop. And sure enough, here at 2.15, you know, and it's putting the thunderstorms where we're actually starting yes. to see the activity on radar. It, it's likely going to be north of Interstate 10 with most of the action, but there's still going to be some thunderstorms closer to Interstate 10 through this evening. So some areas will get some beneficial rain, and this is not our only chance. I mean, we've got a surface trough. We've got an upper level trough and then yeah. we've got a lot of moisture. So all the ingredients in play and then thunderstorms into this evening in the inland spots. May yeah, get, keep it, yeah, wow. May keep it quieter. This is tomorrow morning. It's showing a little bit more over the coastal waters and then we'll advance it again tomorrow. And here come the thunderstorms starting to develop back over the land areas tomorrow afternoon. And yeah, so we're getting more opportunities for showers and storms that may be a little more scattered than a lot of people like, but there will be some beneficial rain and temperatures are actually gonna be a whole lot better tomorrow. Yeah, with the, and you can see it with the amount of cloud coverage uh, the next couple of days. And yes, eventually the temperatures will drop. Um, and just something to note, you can see some of these storms in, on the model showing up relatively strong um, I do think there is the possibility of some really heavy downpours. We had a severe thunderstorm warning with that storm last night. Sure did. And we had, you know, we, we had the possibility for some of these storms to produce gusty winds. So keep that in mind. We're going to see a few severe thunderstorm warnings probably. I mean, that's a trade-off. We yeah. need the rain, and it's about the only way we get it. Unfortunately, it may come with a few strong storms. And you see the model still looks pretty active in the inland spots through tomorrow afternoon and evening. Keep in mind, Wednesday will be a little bit of a lower day as far as things go with the rain. Now tomorrow's highs, this is really crazy now. We may actually only be in the low 90s. So we've gone from 106 to 91, a 15 degree drop with our actual air temperatures. That doesn't reflect the humidity though. And the heat index is still going to be up there a little bit tomorrow because now we're getting that deeper moisture coming in 
possibly coming in subtle influences from Idalia and then also uh, that surface trough. So we've got some higher moisture content. We'll still have that muggy feel. Yeah, That's very sticky line. feeling outside, but not 100 something. So going forward through the end of the week, uh, a rain chance at 70% on Tuesday, a couple of drier days as Idalia goes to our east and takes some of the moisture with it. And then we start to see another little uptick in showers as we head into the weekend. And this is our current thinking. I'm going to be tweaking these numbers on Fox News at 4, 5, and 9 p.m. But this is Labor Day Monday. And we are looking at scattered showers and storms, maybe even likely showers and storms Friday and Saturday. It does look like a drier trend as an upper ridge begins to build back in. That means an increase in heat too for Labor Day. I see the upper ridge in the long range models, but the heights are not as tall as the one that was this, I mean, can we call it a death ridge, the heat <laughs> dome? Right, so it's not that intense, but we do see ridging building back in uh, going into the following week. Yeah, and we, I noticed this early and we've been seeing it. The models are definitely trending up in the extended outlook. So it's going to, we're gonna be dealing with a little bit more heat as we get into September, but. Average is 90, so we're getting there um, yep. in the coming days. Also, just something to note, we might see some interesting high clouds Wednesday and kind of the back half of Thursday thanks to the outflow from Adalia. So that might be something to look at right. uh, in the sky. Uh, you're going to see most likely high cirrus clouds as the outflow of the storm is, uh, since we will still be kind of where we can see a little bit of the outflow of the storm, the high cirrus. Yeah, you can use your Fox 10 app if you mm -hmm. see a real cool cloud picture, just take a picture of it, go to our Fox 10 weather app or our news app and upload your pictures and we may use them on air. Mm -hmm. Well, Nicholas, thanks for joining us and hopefully you've learned a few things about what's going on with Idalia and also our local forecast. And I'll be in on Fox 10 News at 4, 5 and 9 p.m. with more updates.